is noon and so we are going to get started. I expect that we'll have some folks join us along the way. Um, but hi everyone, welcome to our Wednesday webinar series here at One School House. I'm Sarah Hanwald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One School House. And joining me here is my usual co-conspirator, Peter Gao, who many of you know, but we also have a special guest today. Connie White, who is the Director of Learning Design and Innovation at Woodward Academy in Atlanta. And Connie was um, kind enough to come and share some work that she's been doing. I'm gonna let her introduce herself and I'm gonna mute myself in just a moment. Um, she took one of the first offerings of our academic leadership course and then has developed a resource uh, and I mean, it's a resource with a capital R for her faculty that when she and I were talking about, it, I said, oh my goodness, will you please come on our Wednesday webinar and share what you're doing when we can't be together. We can't have our full faculty meetings. We can't have those workshops before school starts. And uh, so I want to thank you so much, Connie, for being here with us today. It's good to be here and I'll not spend a lot of time and I want you to know that um, this has been a process certainly not perfect and if, as you see the things that we're doing please share any suggestions or ideas that you have that's the great thing about being a collaborative group that shares with one another but uh, we did start a task force at Woodward Academy and my one of my responsibilities was to lead the professional development that our teachers would need in order to um, optimally prepare them for this upcoming year since we didn't know what that might look like so I would like to share uh, some of the uh, major parts of our summer professional development plan with you. And um... thank you. While you're sharing your slides, I'm just going to mm -hmm. share. If everyone would, if you've got questions, put them in the Q and A, and Peter and I will keep an eye on those and ask them to Connie either when it seems like they're right at the right time or um, hold them until the end. So please use the Q and A for questions. As Sarah was sharing, when I came to my classroom, I, I can't get in today, so I can't see, I don't have my second screen. I just couldn't get in because they had me locked out. So we'll, um, we'll do our best today. All right, so with our summer professional development, we basically divided this into four major areas to help our teachers in the areas that we felt were most needed. And that included uh, a, a thorough curriculum review, best practices for hybrid instruction assessment, and then learning experience design. So those were the four major areas that we identified. We had a lot of, um, in the spring, we identified assessment as a major area. So we started a resource in that area first, um, but then in the summer, we wanted to intensively provide opportunities for all of our teachers. Um, the first part was a curriculum review, and we actually started this before the end of the school year. I work with uh, all of the department chairs across our school, as well as a core curriculum team which is made up of the department chairs, the assistant department chairs, and then representatives from all of the different levels, pre-K through 12. And we meet in quarterly throughout the year to really talk about our uh, learning targets, the um, different units within courses, the scope and sequence, and that kind of thing. And this year, it was really important for us to look at our curriculum and to identify those things that we absolutely had to make sure that we addressed and taught during this hybrid experience because we knew we wouldn't have as much time. We certainly didn't in the spring. We couldn't, and that's not the intent. The intent is to truly help our children um, gain and master as much as possible within the time and within the structure that we have. So that was the first part of this. Um, not only did we go through as a team during the summer, we met several times to identify those units that we would not teach in a hybrid environment, but also we identified in surveys or, or lead survey uh, review across every course, K-12, to identify those areas in the spring that really needed additional focus. And so after we started working, um, we realized, you know, there's a lot of pieces of this. So when we come back, because we are narrowing down topics, we need to think about um, some type of uh, diagnostic assessment so that teachers can identify um, what actually has to be reviewed in order for the children to be successful with the units that would be taught. Tom Guskey wrote an awesome article about this a few uh, weeks ago. So that has been what we started as far as this area. 
within our curriculum mapping program, we highlighted those areas that we would not address because we have, you know, about 2,500 students. We have multiple teachers, teachers that teach multiple courses, and we wanted to try to be as aligned as much as possible across our school. So that was the first element. The second element was um, best practices for hybrid instruction. And with, with this, this is where the uh, One Schoolhouse course was so helpful for me personally, because we created an online course and the course was intended to take between six and uh, seven hours. Unfortunately, I've heard that it took a little longer than that, but there's some people that just wanna read everything. And I gave optional assignments, like for example, create your little emoji. And, and some people just want to do everything. So keep that in mind. The way that um, I designed it was covering or addressing these major modules. Um, there were four or actually six modules that we focused on. The student-teacher relationship, we know that that's the primary concern that, that students feel cared about and loved and um, that, that we have to help our teachers with ideas for this. So we wanted our teachers to, to think about ways that they could foster and enhance that relationship. And that included everything from creating a student um, survey to identify their strengths and weaknesses or their interests so that you could weave those into the instructional process to um, diagnostic polls on their social emotional state so that teachers could could identify when children were quiet or acting out that maybe there was something else that was going on um, and the module of communication essentials so that we could align across our school how students would find out things like um, how to contact their teacher, how to turn in their assignments, all of those things that they don't need to have to worry about. We could um, truly make all of those things very clear and transparent, and that would simplify the whole process. We also had to come together on that. So that meant meeting with the principals so that we could decide on you know, those elements within um, even a unit design that would be posted online. So communication essentials, course structure, student engagement, technology integration, and assessment. Some of the things that were highlighted in the One Schoolhouse course, we, um, we truly incorporated things like simplification of the tools. So we narrowed down and shared a tool list. And so that meant collaborating with all the instructional specialists across the school. Um, the student engagement piece, we brought in a lot of things, um, including teacher clarity, um, increasing the challenge with our students. And um, let's see, it was teacher clarity, and um, challenge and relationship, but that goes back to the relationship. So within each of these modules, we developed the different components. And, um, and with that, so here's an example of the teacher-student relationship. We used the goals that um, one schoolhouse shared with us. We modified them a bit. And in each of these units, we used the goals and then, then gave teachers options that they could explore after some of the major elements that were important within that unit they had different options so that they could um, review some of these ideas and then incorporate one or two that they might wanna use in their own classes. So this again was one piece of this. We did give an assessment at the end. So far the assessments have um, come back pretty positively. I've been pleased about that. But when you're talking about teachers K-12, there's always teachers that um, want to be, they expected something different. They expected us to go into more depth with the tools and it's not about the tool. So those teachers were like, why aren't we going into more depth with this? Um, and that was, that was uh, a challenge. We've just now added the instructions for our, um, our OWL pros so that they would know how to set those up and that training will be when they get back. But, but they expected something, some of them did, not all, most were very, very grateful. But just know when you're providing something across K-12, everybody's not going to be happy and you have to just try to do your best um, hey. and explain that. Yeah, so. Connie, I just want to clarify one thing because this question's come in. Did all the teachers need to take this course? We, um, some of the principals re required or strongly suggested it. We did give it, sort of gamified it so that everybody that took it would receive um, points and that would go toward their, we call them Cooley points. And so they earn um, Amazon gift cards based, on, it's not a lot, it's very small. But um, you know, it's interesting because some people want to know every single thing and others are making sure that I'm not going to ever take it down. And then, you know, it seems like sometimes people who need it most don't realize they need it most. And um, they'll say, well, it really didn't challenge me because I know all of that. That's just really good teaching. 
But if we can at least raise everybody up to a certain level, then that was the intent of the course. So, but I would say that, um, I would say that probably 60, 70% at this time have completed it. So that's, that's um, pretty pleased with that. Overall, I, I, I hope that more of them will complete it by the time school starts. So the next piece of this was assessment. And that, as I said, began early before we ever left. A lot of teachers were um, wanting to have ideas about how, what assessment might look like online because we know that it is different. And so the shift between more of a performance mindset to more of a learning and mastery mindset was something that, uh, that happened. And teachers realized that they could not assess the way that they previously uh, were successful doing that. So this is a very expansive website and I tend to do that, but we did narrow it down so that um, we also, as part of this assessment piece, uh, we created online webinars for each division so that we could target those examples to every age level of teacher and it would look, you know, so we had a K, we had an elementary um, assessment uh, webinar and then we had an upper 712 and then we gave one for teachers that really wanted to focus on differentiation and those students that might have learning differences what might be some types of formative assessment that would be successful with those students and then the major areas that we focused on included the diagnostic which included both an academic assessment and what what those um, low stakes assessments might look like in order for teachers to identify essential skills and then the social emotional assessment with the skills. Uh, the formative assessment, we used a lot of, um, combined a lot of the research that's out there, a lot from Dylan Willett, Williams. So, um, you know, we wanted to know how teachers could assess while they were teaching and we gave them ideas for that. And then what are formative assessment strategies that they can use um, after teaching? So um, ideas, you know, and I have just a ton of these on our site that, that to give them ideas. Um, and then, you know, peer assessment, what does that look like? You know, think pair share, how can they learn how to give one another feedback in a way that's not hurtful? So we wanted to create um, the language for that. And so there needs to be, and so I gave them some little protocols for that, some sentence starters, um, two stars and a wish, lots of little ideas for the um, peer feedback. And then the last part was the self feedback. How can they learn to really take control of their learning and learn how to assess their own work and what does that look like and that process of growth. And we gave them lots of ideas for that. Um, they explored the different tasks. And I think I put, this is an example of the workspace that we used in conjunction with the webinar. And then the tasks they would explore and then share with one another based on their age levels. So this was um, the assessment piece and what we've done so far to work on this. Uh, this has led to teachers that have contacted us about or contacted me about things that they uh, wanted, were excited about or, or things that they've created since we, since we started this. So the next part of this was learning experience design. And, um, and this was because we had such an interest in teachers becoming more proficient with project-based learning and the development of performance tasks within their curriculum. We saw that a traditional assessment wasn't as successful so we brought in Susie Boss as one of our experts and uh, every division received a 30 minute screencast to really set the stage for what this is. And then they um, received an hour and a half interactive uh, presentation with Susie and they worked together by division and, and by grade level bands. And then they put together their project and then shared with one another and that was great. And they shared all of those in a uh, folder that everybody has access to. And so actually they built upon each other. And this was a great start for this. And this is a, was at the beginning of the summer. Now, Susie will come back uh, at our conference that we're going to have um, August 3rd and 4th. We always have an annual conference every year. This year, it's uh, going to be, of course, online, a virtual conference. And um, it focuses on STEAM, best practices for online teaching, and then assessment for learning, and then social, emotional, ethical. That's also been a huge emphasis with the uh, the issues that all of us are facing. So we're also looking at our curriculum for opportunities to um, update and truly make our, our curriculum uh, more impactful in the area of, you know, for diversity, inclusion, and racial issues and that kind of thing. So that's another thing that we're working on. So this particular, our conference this year is, is, um, is going to be August 3rd and 4th. We're really excited about it. 
have a lot of great people coming in. Everyone from Aaron Titus that does a lot with um, the integration of coding without math, upper school math and science teachers learning to code. Rick Ormelli is an assessment guru. Uh, Heidi Hayes Jacobs is doing a lot. She, she has a great blog right now if you haven't seen it, Personalized Learning. That can help all of us we, as we narrow down our topics. Social emotional learning, STEAM as I said is a, um, is a focus. So we have Jamie Hip. Sylvia Martinez is um, really leading, she's leading some wonderful sessions on STEAM and 21st century skill development. And we have a lot of independent schools as well. Rosetta Lee is really one of the best that I've heard in the area of social emotional ethical. She's leading a lot of conversations with our teachers about how to have the conversations with race, uh, identity sessions, and that kind of thing. Uh, Walter Greeson, another social emotional expert that does a lot with STEAM. From Emory, we use the C social emotional curriculum. Sarah Thomas is an ISTE um, technology skill person. Um, let's see, my screen is covered with yourself. So uh, Rochelle Poff uh, is one of the leaders now in the area of um, IR, VR, and AR. So she's going to share with us what that might look like. Steve Stasek, Gary Staker, and I could go on and on. Susie Boss is coming back. And with all these speakers, um, oh, and I love Darren Babel, we're asking that they, this is just not a one and done, but they actually come back and agree as part of this experience to come back during the year and offer another concurrent session to build on the work that we do during the summer. So um, this has been exciting. So we have a lot of people coming. So that's really the four major areas. And I know that I like to share a lot. So I don't mean to, it's just that I get excited about all the things that are going on. So what kind of questions? I'll stop yeah. sharing. <laughs> that's great. We have some questions. Um, and I'll remind all of you, if you will put them in the Q&A, it's a little bit easier for me to manage them. I have a couple of messages to me as well. So Connie, I'm gonna start with the, the, so you have this conference that you do and you do this every summer for all your teachers. We do, and it is required for all of our teachers, but we do allow, we actually encourage outside people to attend. We always learn from others. And they, they give us great ideas about speakers that they want to hear. So the cost for attending our conference is only $89 um, for the two full days. Um, and uh, as I said, the speakers are incredible, lots of choices, lots of great keynotes, and, or $75 if there's five or more. So it's not making money for us, but it's an opportunity for us to have this uh, exposure for our teachers for ex, you know, to experts that are top in the country. And actually we have some international people that are joining us. So, so um, that's, that's the intent. We do it every year. This is our fifth year. Wow, so it's just, I think in terms of scale, that's really interesting, right? Because you are such a large school, you can, you know you have hundreds of attendees anyway, just with your own faculty, so that's key. So Michelle wants to know if you will share that assessment website with us, the one that you made about assessment. Let me see if I can do that. I, um, it's a lot of stuff, and I wanna make sure, that, honestly, here's the thing I've, I've put on there, um, I did, you know how you do the Bibme bibliography? And so yes. I did that on every slide, but I wanna make sure that I don't get into trouble because I was doing it for our school. So, um, okay. but I have tried to, to I'll be, I'm being totally honest. I wanna make sure I've cited everything correctly. Yeah. So how are y'all gonna handle the start of school differently this year in terms of your faculty gatherings? We have, um, we, as I said at the, in March, we put together a school-wide task force and we are a large school. And so this group met every single week and we will, we are starting back to school with our students face-to-face -face, um, on August 13th, uh, which I know it, it's shocking, but the, we have a safety coordinator. We have all of the people in our school that have been working specifically on different elements. So there will be 15 students in a classroom. Um, those students will be separated by six, the six feet distance, we've incorporated the social distancing, the use of masks. Teachers in the beginning of the year meetings, of course, we can't have a large gathering. So our, our new faculty orientation elements, as well as our new faculty, uh, or just the pre-planning will all take place via Zoom. Um, uh, we, we've worked on our schedule so that there's passing time and uh, the organization of how children actually meet each other in halls, you know, they have a certain route, that kind of thing. So um, it's a very, actually, if you go to our website, woodward.edu, you'll see most of that is posted. It's free of charge. And um, you can see a lot of the different pieces, but we have, for example, 
in a lab when those students come back, there's a three phase disinfecting process for lab equipment. We, we have gloves, but then there's also, we're doing a fog. We're, we have this fog with less electrostatic um, positive ions to disinfect the papers or whatever it is that students are interacting with. And then we have sterilization wipes. So the, everybody involved in this process has really focused on their area and we brought it together and we tried to create a plan. I, I just hope that it's, it's going to work, you know, and we, yesterday we had a, had a, um, a really great um, forum for all of the teachers and our president to talk through a lot of the questions that we had. We do, if we, uh, we have a social distance uh, or a, um, a tracking plan, one of our teachers has been through that, that training to know as students sit in the same seat every day, those that will be infected if someone gets um, the virus and then how that will impact others. And then the 14 days that they'll have to stay home teachers also are getting 14 days in case they get COVID and then if they get it again they'll get 14 more days. So the other thing that I'm really excited about is that we're providing daycare for those teachers that have children in the public schools. Um, the public schools here will not start in many of the counties and so um, we have a, a social a summer program as well as a horizons program that that goes on at our school and so those leaders are offering this program for teachers children so that our teachers hey. can come back. I wanted to go back to something you said earlier, though. You mentioned that you were going to have your beginning of school faculty meetings on Zoom. And have you been thinking about how to make those more, um, more of a learning opportunity for faculty? Yes. So, for example, um, we read two books as a faculty this summer. Um, we and, and of course, my mind is blank and I can't see any of okay. it. So, we um, all <laughs> but within that, um, there are instructional strategies and suggestions that we, because we do need to mix it up. We need to model what we want our teachers to do. So um, we'll have conversations, we'll have Zoom breakouts, we'll have interactive mentee polls. So yes, we're trying to model that. Um, so that it's not just not a dump. And then everything that we do of course is recorded and then we try to have a companion resource that teachers can go back to to explore. Okay, so I like that. So you're bundling the companion resource. Mm -hmm. So Michelle asks, she noticed that you mentioned that some one of the things you decided is what's going to work in hybrid and what's not and how you would cut things. Did you have a protocol for deciding how you would prioritize things or did you have guiding questions like how did you how did you set up that process we did so within our core curriculum team and I actually had a list of questions so the department chairs in most areas now with language arts it's different because we had to break that down even further but um, it was broken down by um, you know by the by division but for the others for science for example we brought in the science teachers or those that were focusing on science and then we we looked at, we wanted to not only look at what was taught in that particular course, but we wanted to see what was taught the previous year and what would be taught the next year so that we could pull out those essential um, skills and those essential, you know, learning targets that we wanted to make sure that our students would achieve. So the department chairs helped lead that. I actually put together um, a, uh, some of those guiding questions as well as protocols for conversation so that we could get everybody's feedback. But that's how that happened and then we highlighted those areas that we thought you know what this is not essential in the big picture this is not an essential skill and it's interesting because math is more of one of those subjects that really does build on itself but things like science and social studies it wasn't as hard as we thought we're also you know we're already looking at social studies and language arts to see um, how we how because we need to do some work in those areas as far as uh, with social emotional skills and and um, racial conversations and making sure that we have an accurate portrayal of history within our curriculum. So those are already taking place, but um, that, that's how we, we did it. Yeah. So are you, um, I don't want to say anticipating because that's uh, more of a positive word, but are you planning for the fact that school may need to close still. I know that right now, you know, you're talking about coming in, but have you had your teachers build certain modules online that they can flip, flip the switch and deliver online if they must? 
everything in the course um, was focusing on, and, and this is something that we learned in one schoolhouse, everything in the course was focusing on the online experience, making sure, because 20%, 20 to 25% of our parents said that regardless of what we do, they're not sending their children back. They want to be taught remotely. That's why we, that's why hybrid was so important for us. So we're designing for an online experience with the enhanced face-to-face -face for those children that show up. I don't know, the numbers in Georgia, as you know, are rising exponentially. I don't know what, what that will look like, um, but I don't know of anybody that could have taken more care in planning all of this. So, um, but we will learn very quickly, I think, if, if things don't work the way they should. But yeah. it's all planned toward the online. Uh, Peter, what questions do you have? Well, I, I've got one. I'm just looking at that very um, uh, comprehensive course that you created for your faculty and kind of thinking for some people that was going to be, must have been a much steeper learning curve than for others and wondering how, how folks were, were supporting one another, how, as they went through that, how people were able to bring each other along or for people who may have heard concepts that were entirely new. How, how, how did you all make that work? I'm, I'm fascinated. Many of, many of the teachers worked um, per grade level. I didn't, the assessments for these, you know, it, the information was there, the video, the interactive videos, it was very strategic in, in pulling out those things that were most helpful. But we did not want to make this something that people hated to do. And I, I learned at the very beginning, I asked them to create a unit I could not believe that some people, or just to fill in a one day lesson plan. And that the first few people, it, they, they spent way too much time. So then I narrowed it back and said, fill in one block <laughs> in this lesson <laughs> plan because teachers want to do a good job. And uh, many teachers on the same grade level work together. But Peter, we, we you know, this was, this hit us. We um, came up with this plan. We knew this would be helpful. Um, I, I, don't, I know it's not perfect, but I think that would have been something that we could have added would, be, would have been that teachers work together and they would have learned more. Now, I did include as far as the tasks and all of those tasks were clearly communicated at the beginning. There weren't any uh, rigorous tasks, but um, they did respond to one another. So we asked them to share on the discussion, every, just about every one of those modules they shared in some way and then they built on each other so that I, it was just exciting to me to see a kindergarten teacher, you know, respond to a senior physics teacher and say, oh, that's a great idea. I never thought of that. And then the second grade teacher that had such a great idea that the um, upper school language arts teacher, oh, I just love choice boards and I'm going to try to do that. So there was a lot of learning. Um, another issue, I want to be totally honest, is that when you have as many teachers as we do, there is absolutely no way that I can give feedback to everyone because even with 11 tasks, I think we ended up with um, 10, and then you multiply that by the number of teachers, it, it has been, and then combined with all the other things on my plate right now, that's, I feel like they're giving each other feedback, but a few of the things I ask them to turn into me, and, and I have not had time to go through all of those. So that's, I should have thought through that a little bit more. That was but, a failure. It just sounds like an opportunity to build a, a culture of collaboration in, in a kind of a neat way. And so another, <clears throat> you know, sm not even that small a silver lining to the, the cloud under which we're all living. Thank you for that. And, oh, Sarah. Well, we're almost done, but just one question that's come in, Connie, is so what are next steps for you? And, um, and this, question is anonymous and you're going to figure out why in a second but you know it seems like your school has a plan what will you do if that plan doesn't work out and you do have to go on campus like how will you pivot your PD for your faculty well as I said the PD has been really focused on online instruction in a hybrid situation so we want them to post and communicate to those students at home and we want to engage those students so this week we will be have training on the using the hybrid out the owl um, pro and how that will be managed with students at home because we don't want the little the little ones to be sit we don't want our students to be sitting in front of a computer all day so um, trying to to create the design that lends itself to the student 
centered type of situation um, has been the goal all along. But um, I'm sure things hit us every day and we keep on having to back up and regroup and that's just what we, we have to do. So this, the planning for the unknown has been difficult and that's why this, our plan has been multifaceted and, and trying to meet everyone where they are. But I'm sure we'll look back at it just like I'm, I'm thinking about, oh, I would have done this differently now. Um, but that's how we learn, I guess. Um, and with the things that we did in the spring with preparing teachers for the online instruction, our teachers grew tremendously. But as, a, as we've said, we, we, can't, we have to be the best in this area. We have to really raise the level. And, and our teachers have wanted to do that. They want their children to learn. And I've just been so blown away by how hard everybody's working. So if, it, if our plan and the training um, does not help teachers get to where they need to be, then we'll have to back up, regroup, and, and go at it again with another um, collaborative solution. <laughs> That's all I know, but um, it has been, it's been exciting that we're trying to um, identify these solutions that will help and collaborate with others, and our, it seems like we always grow, but I wish we'd had more time. Yeah. No vacation this year. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we all wish we had more time. And speaking of time, we're running out here. But I just think, Connie, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing. And just the way that you, um, you know, you say no vacation. It's so clear that you built out the resources and created on campus for your faculty something that has legs. Right, so not everything that you said about assessment is just for this year with hybrid, and I think this is gonna go forward. And so I just wanna thank you for sharing that with us. We thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. And everybody, this will be on YouTube shortly. Bye-bye. Thank you.